This is the second talk. Last week, we spent our whole time talking about asking the question, what is salvation? And looking at various metaphors, images that are in the scripture and that are popular uh, about uh, salvation. And uh, I tried to draw us to a point where uh, we could understand that first, salvation is a mystery. It's not something that can be explained as, oh, it's this and this. There are a multitude of images and metaphors used to explain uh, what salvation is. It's like this, it's like this, it's like, it's like marriage, it's like adoption, it's like a, a, a legal change of status. It's like a sacrifice. It's like all of these uh, metaphors and images. Because what salvation actually is, is, is mysterious to us. We, we can't define it and say it's A, B, C, and D. It's, has some, it has to do with our relationship with God. And uh, it's you know, it's beyond simple, rational analysis. Having said that, uh, the second thing that was important to remember, I think, from our first talk, if you remember these two things, you get credit for the last talk. <laughs> See, if you didn't attend the last two talks, and remember the summary, you get credit for it. <laughs> is that salvation is a journey. It's not a matter of, oh, I was on this side of the line and then I wasn't saved, and then I crossed over to this side of the line and now I am saved, as though salvation were about location, whether that's physical location or location in your head. I didn't believe this and now I believe that, and therefore I'm saved, right? That uh, from looking at the images and metaphors that are in the scripture and uh, that are used by the church, salvation is understood at, more as a direction we are walking than a goal we have already obtained. Right? So uh, we use the image of someone walking up a hill or down a hill, and various different images we talk about. Okay, so anything else from last week that was really significant that anyone would like to bring up before we move on? Okay. It's very common in the church to take a parable or a saying of Jesus or an incident in Christ's life and to reflect on it theologically and poetically. So that many of the hymns in the church, especially the best ones during Holy Weeks, the, the ones that really tend to speak to people and stay with people, are hymns that are reflecting on a particular image or incident or parable from the scriptures and looking at it from different angles and saying, How, what does this tell us about our relationship with God? who God is, who we are, and how we relate to each other. One of the most common parables for this is the prodigal son. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the story of the prodigal son and use it to talk about salvation. Salvation in the Orthodox Church. Um, but in a sense, um, we may not go where you think we're going to go. Or we may not get there as quickly as you think we should. <laughs> All right. In the, uh, look at the story of the prodigal son, right? Uh, Jesus tells three stories to the Pharisees. Why? Uh, this is from uh, Luke chapter 14 or 15. Uh, 15, I think. 
Jesus is eating with the publicans and the sinners, and the Pharisees are upset. Why is he eating with publicans and sinners? And Jesus tells three parables, three stories. The first one about a shepherd who loses a sheep, right? And he goes and finds the sheep, and they all rejoice. About a woman who loses a coin, and how she diligently searches for the coin. Imagine that. I mean, this is in the days before electricity. It, nowadays, you can turn on the light in the room and look about. Imagine you're in a room, you lose something, and the best thing you can do is a little oil lamp. Imagine looking, right? It's, it's not like the whole room is lit up and I can see the whole room. They're going with this little lamp into every corner and taking the lamp into every little edge of the room in order to see. So it's a... It's actually, this is how God looks for the lost soul. Not like, oh, he flips on the light and goes, oh, there's one, there's one, there's one. It's like this, this image of this woman with a lamp looking, looking, this little oil lamp, little flame, looking in this corner, crawling around on her belly, looking in all the edges, right? And the third is the prodigal that we, the story we call the uh, prodigal son. But actually, the prodigal son is not the central figure of this story. Because the story isn't just about the prodigal son. The prodigal is a, the story is about a man who had two sons. The story is about a man who had two sons. And so the central figure in this story is the father. The father is the central figure because he's the father of the two sons. And so as we start to reflect on what does this parable teach us about who God is, who we are, what our relationship with God is, we have to begin by reflecting about father. God as father. Um, Many of us who come from uh, a uh, kind of low church Protestant background are already used to thinking about God as Father. Although we may not have thought about it too deeply, maybe we have. That God is Father means that God is person. That is, in order to be father, there has to be son or there has to be children. God can't be father unless there's children. He's not father. And in fact, we learn something about who the son is because there can't ever be a time when there wasn't a son because then he wouldn't be father. And so this is why the church says that Jesus is divine with the same divinity of the Father because he was begotten of the Father before there was time. Before There was never a time when there was Father without Son. Because without Son there's no Father. Father doesn't exist without a Son or child in our case. And so there was a man with two sons, right? It's kind of, kind of interesting. There isn't a, well, what about before that? There is no before that. Because God is eternal and God is Father, God's fatherness and thus sonness, that the Son exists. Uh, the, Church teaches that um, God is the first person of the Trinity. Right? We believe in a three-personed divinity. Uh, the word in English, Godhead, is really confusing in English. What does that word mean, Godhead? It's all throughout the New Testament, right? The Godhead. What the heck does that mean? It's a translation of the Greek word, divinity. 
And it comes from that older sense of the word head, like source, like a spring, the head of a, a river or something. So the source of divinity. When the scripture talks about the Godhead, it's talking about, the, it's a just a translation of the Greek word divinity, the divinity. That the Father is the source of this divinity. The Son is begotten of the Father. Not because he's less than the Father, but because that's the definition of the relationship. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. We'll talk about that maybe a lot more later, but for right now, what we're going to focus on the Father. Um, it's very interesting that in the Old Testament, the uh, calling God Father was not common. It exists in a couple places, but not at all common. A more common uh, metaphor for God in the Old Testament is bridegroom, husband. Much more common. Much more common than father. And uh, some of the church fathers say that one of the reasons that Jesus was incarnate, that God became man in Christ, was to reveal to us the Trinity. That is, we would not know that God exists as a person, as, a, as three persons, uh, if Christ hadn't come. And so you might ask, well, how does Christ reveal the Trinity? Well, through his baptism, right? The voice of the Father bore witness, right? The Spirit descended like a dove. Revealing his baptism, revealing the Trinity. There's the uh, transfiguration, again, with the voice of the Father. Christ transfigured in front of them, uh, shining whiter than that. That shining is the Holy Spirit. There's the Great Commission. I got to reflect on that a lot this week. Um, Matthew says, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Right? So in the Great Commission, we have this. And then in the apostolic writings, uh, 1 Peter and uh, 1, 2, and 2 Corinthians 13, 14, these, uh, and then, you know, the love of the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit, um, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit. So in the apostolic writings, we have, you don't have this in the Old Testament. You don't have this idea of God existing as three persons. God is uh, m much, just not revealed, not much, not much revealed. And of course, what the teaching is, the places where God is revealed in some specific way in the Old Testament, as the angel of the Lord, for example, these, the, the church fathers have interpreted these as pre-incarnate revelations of Christ. I mean, maybe this background stuff's kind of boring. I'm sorry. It's, it's boring to you. Um, but let's, let's just try to push through it. Why is this? Do you know, in Islam, in the entire Quran, God is never, ever, ever referred to as love or as loving, or as loving anyone. He's referred to as being merciful. He's referred to as being just. And certainly, the Christian God is merciful and just. But there's something a person can do, person can love. And this is why conceiving of God as person is really important. But it's tricky because you want to say, well, wait a minute, you know, are, we are we polytheists? Do we believe in three gods? Is this, is this our teaching? No, it's not. 
And we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. But this one God exists in three persons. A fellowship, there's a technical term in Greek of interpenetrating love. How are the Father, the Son, and the Spirit one? They're one because they interpenetrate each other with love, which is an intentional, has an intentional sexual connotation, right? That it's through their interpenetrating love, they're inside each other in love. And that's what makes them one. That's what makes them one. Not only do we have the uh, uh, testimony of the apostles in the New Testament, but then we also have the liturgical formulas of the early church, the baptismal formula, right? Baptizing the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Various liturgical formula from the early church where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then this is the tricky one. And this is probably the hardest one for most of us. We have the testimony of very holy people, whom we call saints generally, who have experienced God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who have experienced God as Trinity. And this is a little bit hard for us because as uh, North Americans, Europeans, we're used to being individuals. If something is true, I should be able to find it or experience it myself. We don't really do well with a, um, a world view that says, well, actually only some people can know and experience this because they are, uh, they have made themselves worthy to experience it or uh, made themselves available to experience it. We think that, um, you know, for example, none of us in this room have been to the moon, but apparently, Several people have been to the moon. Uh, I've actually, I had a, when I was a kid, I was living in a foster home, and one of the foster, my, one of the foster homes I lived in, the foster parent was a geologist, and his job was to take the rocks they brought back from the moon and cut them into microscope, little, little slices that you could look through through my, um, microscopes. Uh, so I got to see these rocks, right? And actually, you know, pretty awesome. Um, but how do I know? I didn't experience it myself. I have to take the word of someone else, right? If I'm sick, as much as I respect Matt, I'm not going to go to Matt and say, Matt, I got this strange growth here. You want to take a look at it and tell me what I think? Why? Because Matt hasn't spent 12 years studying medicine. Right? I'm going to go to a doctor, and I may not receive the first thing the first doctor says. I may go to a couple different doctors. But why? Because this person has put in the time, the work, the energy to actually become an expert in this field so that he knows some things that I don't know. Well, it's the same thing with the saints. It's the same thing. If somebody goes to a monastery when he's 18 years old, or she's 18 years old, spends 30 or 40 years praying six or eight hours a day, not distracted by 
worldly things so that when she's not in actual liturgical prayers, she can keep her mind on Christ at all times. You know, after 30 or 40 years of that, your knowledge and awareness of God is going to be pretty deep. And that person may know God in ways that I'll never really get a chance to know God that way in this life. Because I'm distracted. I'm married, I've got grandkids, I've got, I got stuff, I've got to run church, I've got this, that. Which is good. It's my calling. I love it. I don't think I could live that way for very long. I go to the monastery three times a year and I do at that <laughs> for three or four days. It's good for me and I'm usually really happy to get there and then really happy to come home. <laughs> uh, but you, you see, so one of the things that's very important in the church is the testimony of saints. The testimony of holy people, in the same way that we would respect the testimony of a very experienced doctor or engineer or, or somebody, right? Um, so, God is a person. God isn't an essence. God has an essence, right? Divinity. Right? In the same way that you have an essence. You're human. Right? And here's a really freaky thing. There is, there are only two human beings. There are only two humans. There's the old Adam and the new man, Adam. And each person, there's two natures, right? There's human nature and it exists as old or new. And both those realities, if you've been baptized, are struggling within us. The old man and the new man, the old nature and the new nature. Only one human nature and billions of human persons. Right? So when we think of God as three persons, one nature, one divine nature. Okay? He, he's a person who has a nature, right? But he's not just that's not like Buddhism. Our goal is not to disappear into God. That's not our goal. Like, I don't know if you ever read any Meister Eckhart, the uh, German mystical philosopher. Um, you know, that our goal is to become so empty that we just kind of fade and dissolve into God. Very uh, Buddhist, uh, uh, Hinduist sort of way of looking at things. This is not the Christian teaching. We don't disappear in God. Our relationship to God is now and always will be person to person. It will be personal. What's going to change in us is our nature from the old human nature, the nature of Adam, to the new Adam, the new, the new nature in Christ. And that's the journey, that's the transformation, yes? So we remain whole. Right. We remain whole. Separate maybe not the right word for it. Because we're united with Christ in the same way that a husband and wife would become one but are still remain themselves. Right? Uh, that's one of the images that's used in the scripture. And, right? That we are become the bride of Christ. But we're also united with Christ. So there's the mystery. We and don't a, disappear. We don't disappear. That's exactly true. And, that, and that's the heresy. That's the tempting heresy of contemporary spirituality. A lot of what passes for spirituality, even in the church, or especially in the... But anywhere. Because we live in this culture, in this age we kind of think of the spiritual goal as sort of, I'm going to disappear and, and it'll only be Jesus. No, no. I'm going to be transformed and transfigured 
to be like Christ, I'm not going to disappear. I'm going to be me, only not the me ravished by sin and death. The me who is becoming more and more and more like Christ. Does that help you? Okay. So, and this is why we can say that God loves. He loves us. He doesn't want us to disappear. He loves you. You're a mess. <laughs> I'm a mess. We're screwed up three days ways to Sunday. But that's okay. Because he's saving us. He became... Well, okay, we're jumping ahead of ourselves. Let's not get there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to get to our incarnation yet. Um, all right. So, back to the prodigal son. There was a man who had two sons. <coughs> it's very interesting that Jesus is not the only one that the scripture refers to as a son of God. Both human beings and angels are referred to as sons of God hmm. in the scripture. Right? In the book of Job, on the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan was in their midst. Right? The sons of God. Uh, that it's a reference to uh, created things, both angels and men. So basically, there's these two ways in which uh, persons are referred to as sons. One, the son begotten of the father, who is a son by nature. That is, it's who he is. It's his, when I say by nature, a good way to think of it is the what he isness, the whatness. Right? I, I have a cat named Patches, or Pepper, I don't know, what am I going to We had one named Patches once. I don't think that, I think a Kylie got that cat. Um, yeah, it's a high risk business being a cat in my neighborhood. Um, the, the pay is great, but it's a high risk business. Um, I think the one we have now is Pepper. I just call it the cat. I, if the cat's here, right? The, if you ask, what is it? Like the cat, it's a cat, that's the nature. If you ask who it is, oh, it's Pepper, right? Or Patches. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the cat's name is. Identity crisis. Yeah. The cat's not, the cat knows who it is. I, I, I just know it's the cat, right? So when we talk about the whatness of God, we're talking about God's nature, his essence. Nature and essence, in this case, are synonyms. They're referring to the same thing. Um, and we're talking about the who-ness. That's the person. Who is God? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What is God? God is, is divine. And we often use the word God flipping back and forth, referring, we use God to refer to both who and what. So that's why in English it can be pretty confusing. Uh, I said pretty confusing in Greek too. <laughs> it's pretty confusing. God, Son, Christ, the Logos, is God by nature. It's who he is. The creatures, which would include angels and human beings, they may be referred to as son of God, sons of God, but by creation. And that's different. We are not sons of God by grace, or by nature. We are sons of God by grace. Because God created, in the same way that I would, if I built a machine, I might refer to the machine, especially if I was a guy, I might say something like, that's my baby. That's my baby. If I worked on a car a lot, I, which I have, and 
You know, you put a lot of effort, a lot of time, you get the, the engine and everything where you're really happy with it, you start referring to your car as your baby, right? Um, and okay, it's not the same as a baby by nature, but it is a kind of baby by grace. It's something I created that I have a certain affection for. Now, it's not a person, so it's not the same, so the metaphor breaks down. But it's kind of like that. But God was able to create persons. Not only could he love them, but they could love him back. Um, so what we say is, Jesus is a son by nature. Okay, the Mormons teach, here, let's jump. Did you have a question? No, I'm moving. No. All right. <laughs> the Mormons teach that Satan is Jesus' brother. I don't know if you ever did any Mormonism. I had an acquaintance who was a, a pastor. They call him bishops, a pastor in the Mormon church. And so he sent, spent a couple hours with me on this big whiteboard at the university <laughs> explaining the entire plan of how everything works in Mormonism. And in a certain sense, stay with me here, they both seem to be referred to as sons of God in Scripture. But this is where theology becomes very important. Christ is a son by nature. He is begotten of God. Satan, angels, fallen or otherwise, and human beings are creatures. There is a ontological difference. Does everyone know what that word ontologically means? Okay, it comes from the Greek on, the Greek word own, which means to be or to exist. The what it is-ness is different. So ontology refers to the what it is-ness of something. Just, just walk just by. Dad, <laughs> come here. Come here. Okay. Um, they're different things, different realities. So, um, and so when we look at this parable where it says there was a father who had two sons, it's just kind of interesting that. We're dealing in a universe where there's God who exists as a trinity of persons who then creates beings who are also persons who have the potential to love. Um, in the beginning it says God created man in his image and after his likeness. And the prepositions are different. It's not in his image and in his likeness. There are two separate prepositions. There are different prepositions. In his image and after or according to or some other preposition is likeness. And the consistent teaching of the fathers of the church about that is that in his image refers to uh, what we are in terms of we are like God in many ways. But after his likeness or according to his likeness refers to our potentiality. Right? That is, we were born, we were created with a potentiality. And and that, again, this is this idea of salvation as a journey. Salvation is a potentiality that we work out. It's not whether or not I go to heaven when I die. Right? That's not what salvation is about. Salvation is about becoming like Jesus. Being transformed and transfigured. Yes? So does the process of salvation ever end? No. Well, the growth in Christ never ends because we are forever finite beings being conformed by grace 
to the infinite being of Christ. See? So, uh, one of the fathers, I can't, the name's not coming to me right now, said that the reason why nothing in this world satisfies is because human beings were created with an infinite capacity to desire. This is the potentiality thing. One thing that God gave human beings, different from, say, rocks or snails, is desire. And it's a desire that has an infinite capacity. So there's a potentiality there. And when our desire is wrongly directed, we are forever dissatisfied. Right? Oh, if I just get this, if I just have this boyfriend, if I just have this relationship, if it was just this, if I just can get that, and then you get it and you're not satisfied. Why? Because you were created with an infinite capacity to desire. Nothing in this world is going to satisfy you. What will satisfy you? Christ. <laughs> only God. Only the infinite divinity. And so our desire has to be healed by shifting it from things in this world to our relationship with God. And then, heaven is paradise. The age to come is paradise. Because we are continually desiring more and continually receiving more than we can desire. But as long as our desire is misdirected, which creates what we call passion, which is, is this uh, one way of talking about the brokenness of our humanity, right? Passion, the root meaning of that word is suffering, by the way. Um, it's because of misdirected desire. <coughs> but we'll get to that in just a couple minutes. Okay, God was created, man was created in his image and after his likeness. So that after his likeness refers to a potentiality by grace to participate in what God is by nature. So 2 Peter 1.4, you have become partakers of the divine nature. Right? We become partakers of God himself. This is part of the reason why the Eucharist is so important. Right? Look. I'm just a regular guy, right? Um, I'm not very holy. I'm, you know, I was an English professor, not a very good one. Uh, I just I had to feed my kids, right? You just do what you have to do. And I'm distracted. And, and all of this theology is like way up here. It's, it's really hard to to uh, experience. This is why God gave us liturgy. Because through symbolic actions, we can participate in our physicality, a mystical reality that is really kind of mostly beyond my reach to apprehend. I, I don't really get it. Every now and then I get a, a whiff of it. Every now and then a little bit of the fragrance of heaven passes by and I go, oh, 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 oh where, where, where'd it go? What was that? Right? And so the church, uh, and from the beginning, I mean, these are things, instant baptism and Eucharist, these were instituted by Jesus himself. Right? We participate in this heavenly reality. Um, so this is part of the reason why these are, are important. Okay, one more thing about this uh, potentiality. 
Basil the Great said something quite interesting. He said, a human being is an animal that has received the vocation to become God, or a God. <coughs> you ever heard that before? Yeah. Human being is an animal that has received the vocation, the calling, to become a God. Not by nature, right? We never become uncreated. We are, our only ability to become anything more than what we are is by participation in grace. Now, here's, the com here's a metaphor that was used really early, like really early in the church. Take a sword made out of iron. Okay, iron sword. What the what it isness? It's iron. Now fire. It's very different stuff. The what it isness, the nature of fire, is really different from the nature of iron. But iron, part of the nature of iron is it has a potentiality. That is, iron can participate in the energy produced by the fire and can get really hot. Not from its own energy, but by accepting and participating in the energy of the fire. It can get so hot, it will glow. So it not only radiates heat, it radiates light. It begins to take on the characteristics of the fire, yes? And it changes. Yeah, you're the engineer. I, yeah. <laughs> so lots of stuff happens. Yeah. But it doesn't stop being iron, does it? But it, tra it transforms internally. As well. and yes, it does. Yeah. Right? Gets, and then, then that's how you make harder steel or softer steel, do all kinds of stuff with it. And it can get blended with other stuff. So all this stuff happens, but it's not in the nature of the steel itself to transform itself. So. Human beings were created with this potentiality. We've got the body of animals, right? Um, but we were called to become like God. Not by my ability to, you know, pick myself up from my bootstraps and become a better bootstraps and become a better person. No but by cooperation with the grace of God, which will involve a certain amount of effort on my part. Right? What, what good comes that doesn't require effort? I mean, you know, this, there's this myth out there that Jesus is going to touch me and change me and suddenly I'm going to be different and everything's going to be better. It's like, where does that exist anywhere in the universe? Right? Um, certainly, I have to cooperate, right? You know, uh, I go to the doctor, my chiropractor, and he says, great, I understand what your problem is, we can fix it, do these exercises. Well, wait a minute, you're the doctor, you're supposed to fix me. Well, I will fix you if you do these exercises. Well, what am I paying you for if I have to do the exercises? Well, because you wouldn't know what exercises to do, you wouldn't know how to do them, you wouldn't know how to but you have to participate in it. You have to participate in it. Uh, or there's a real funny, uh, or famous actually, well I say it a lot so it's famous to me, um, <laughs> saying of the Desert Fathers where they, um, you know, how many of you, well of course it's foggy here, but let's say we were in Arizona and we might say how many of you uh, know that the sun rose this morning? Well, we all know that the sun rose. How many of you... <laughs> it's not that big. <laughs> How many of you saw the sun rise? Well, maybe very few of us. Why? Because in order to see the sun rise, you actually have to get up and look for it. Right? You can't make the sun rise, but you can be awake when the sun rises. And this is how the spiritual life works. I can do nothing to 
make God give me grace. But I can put myself in a position to receive the grace and to cooperate with the grace. Okay, just in the last few minutes, let's talk about um, in what ways is the human image like God? Okay. Um, some of the fathers will talk about two things. One is the noetic, N-O-E-T-I-C, noetic faculty. In Eng we don't have a translation in English for it. So sometimes we'll call it heart, sometimes we'll call it spirit. Um, but it's this word in Greek, nous, or noetic faculty. And then freedom. And then sometimes they'll break down that noetic faculty into three qualities. <clears throat> the noose itself, which refers to our spiritual perception, our ability to perceive spiritual reality. <clears throat> and that might equate also in English to what we call our heart. Because our noose is this place where our innermost being is. The me that's inside me, the me that sees me doing things, right? <clears throat> I may do something stupid, the real me isn't the one that did the stupid thing, the real me is the one inside me going, boy, that was stupid, <laughs> right? That's the real me, right? The me within me. Then there's the logos, which translates pretty easily in English as mind, but rational mind, right? My, which includes speech, this ability to think rationally and speak and explain. That this is, this is something that God is like. And if the noose relates to the Father, and the logos, or the reason, relates to the Son, the third thing would be spirit. But not what you probably think by that. When the fathers talk about the human spirit, they're talking about the human ability to desire. The human ability to, uh, to love, to um, long for what is good, true, and beautiful. By the way, in Greek, the word for good is agathos. In Greek, the word for beautiful is agathos. Good and beautiful are the same thing in Greek. Right? And so when the church fathers and in the Bible, when it talks about what is good, you could translate it just as e easily as beautiful. Beauty is important. In fact, there's some fathers who've said things like, beauty will save the world. Beauty is really important. Dostoevsky said that, right? Um, maybe some others have said things like that. I don't know. Dostoevsky is certainly famous for saying that. Um, beauty is, doesn't, who says that? Zosimus in Charismos of Brothers? Um, beauty is really important. What's good is beautiful. What's beautiful is good. And this ability to long for and desire what's good and beautiful is, is part of what makes us in the image of God. And that's part of what gives us the potentiality of be participating in the life of God. Father, is it is it the part of us that can go beyond ourselves? Exactly. That's the interpenetration, like it's, it's the ecstasy? Ecstasy, right. And so this is where this word ecstasy becomes really important. That, um, as is famously pointed out in uh, the New Testament, there are three different words used for love. Phileo, which is like comradeship, friendship. Um, 
eros and agape. And we will commonly hear people say things like, well, agape is the highest kind of love, that's God's love. But to say that is really to misunderstand what these words mean. Because agape is not the same thing as phileo. One's not higher than the other. They're different things, right? If I can show you agape and have no feeling towards you whatsoever, it just means I'm going to do what's best for you. That's what agape means. Uh, in fact, some, uh, some uh, lexicons will say agape is disinterested benevolence, right? Phileo is brotherhood, companionship, much like kinonia, koinonia, right, fellowship. It's this love of, of commonality and friendship. Eros is the love of beauty. Now, in our culture, the word erotic has come to mean something very broken, very sick, very broken. But it is the erotic love, that is the desire for beauty, that God also has towards us and that we have towards God. God, God loves us with agape, right? He, he does what's good for us regardless whether we love him back or not. But God also comes out of himself. Erotic love is a love that goes out. That's why he created. That's why it's the inner penetrating love of the Trinity. That's why he became man. Because this love, this desire, brings you out of yourself to the other. Right? I see something beautiful in you and I go out of myself towards you, right? And this is the love that we're called to have towards God, this, this God, you're so beautiful, right? And it draws us out, and that's what unites us with him. And this ability to love like that is part of our being created in his image. Okay, so image refers to our ontology, the our, what we are. Likeness refers to what we're called to be, our goal, our calling, our objective. We were created in the image of God and after the likeness of God. So what does this have to do with salvation in the Orthodox Church? Most of us have really uh, terrible ideas about what salvation is. We, uh, we don't see it as um, a transformation, a transfiguration, a change. Right? We see it as a one-time payment or a, uh, uh, you know, as a something that uh, I get this thing and then I have it as though it's, um, you know, Thing I can hold on to. But the way the Orthodox Church understands salvation, it's nothing less than a return to the original relationship Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden with the Father before the fall. But we've got a long way to go. We have to be, it's a journey, we have to be transform, transfigure. In a sense, we don't know how sick we are. And that a lot of the journey, I, I sometimes say, <laughs> a lot of growing in God is just growing up. <laughs> that a lot of, of our journey to God is coming to see ourselves. And uh, you know, um, Jesus told the story about uh, 
to Simon the tax, uh, no, Simon the Pharisee when he had him over for supper and the woman came in and uh, washed his feet with her tears and Simon was a little uptight about that and he said, uh, let me tell you, uh, a man had two debtors, one 50 denarii, another 500, he forgave them both, which do you think loved him more? Well, probably the one who was forgiven more. You answered, right, I came into your house and you didn't wash my feet. But this woman hasn't stopped washing my feet with her tears. So our journey is like going from being Simon the Pharisee, who, well, you know, I'm not that bad. Yeah, sure, God forgave my sins, but, you know, I didn't do have any big ones. It wasn't that much. And so we love God very little to becoming like that woman who knows the depths of her brokenness, the depths of her selfishness, her stupidity, all the ways that, that she constantly turns away from God. And her forgiveness, the forgiveness she experienced, causes her to love a lot with tears that, that, and washes feet with her tears. That's our journey, right? We come, our, who we see ourselves to be changes. And thus, who God is changes for us. Not that God's changed at all, but we're able to see more, right? If I don't have many sins, it doesn't take a very big God to forgive them. If I have, if I'm a terrible, rotten sinner, it takes a huge God to forgive me. So God changes in my eyes as my understanding of who I am changes. So we'll end it there in terms of my talking part and um, for today. And we'll continue on with page two and talk a little bit about um, paradise and the fall and the consequences of the fall and maybe what the return to paradise, if we have time next time, what that starts to look like. Okay? Any questions or comments about today? Yes? Can I ask a leading question to next week? Yes? I think. So you're talking about this created nature, that we, or that we're created, and that by nature we are not God. Yes. But we are created to participate in receiving God likeness. Right. Which is really God Himself dwelling in me. Right? Okay. So then, is that kind of what was happening in the garden with the temptation and partaking of the apple in terms of wanting to skip that process? Um. Is that the nature that well, was the temptation? No, here, let me, I'll, I'll help you with this just a little okay. bit. Part of who God is, God is a self-sacrificing God because this is part of what love does. And so when God became man in Christ and he gave his life, he wasn't doing anything different. He was revealing, in fact, it says he revealed what the Father's like in this self-sacrifice. God is a self-sacrificing God. And in order for Adam and Eve to become like God in the Garden of Eden, they also had to have something to sacrifice, something they said no to, something they gave up. And so God said, don't eat of this tree. And in not eating of that tree, they had a way out. Why? Just love, just because the Father said not to, right? Well, it looks good to eat. Well, it can make me wise. Well, all these things. I know, but I will let that go because of the love of the Father, right? And thus becoming more like God by sacrificing, even in the garden. 
but this is not what humanity chose. And of course, it's not what I choose every day when I wake up in the morning. I don't choose to suffer and sacrifice out of love for God and neighbor. I'm continually choosing to reach out and take what I want, what looks good to me, regardless of how it may hurt or affect the people around me. <clears throat> and, and so, does that help? Questions or comments? How is the will um, part of this picture? Is it connected to the spirit? Um, no, the three things, the um, noetic, the noetic, uh, the desiring, and the rational kind of refer to one lump. And then the ability to, to have free will uh, is, is, a, is a different reality altogether. Um, and again, it's a little bit mysterious because free will isn't nearly as free as we think it is. <laughs> um, we're bound with many chains, right? You say, well, I get to choose whether I want the red car or the blue car. But somebody else chose for you what the options would be before you got there. Right? And we are programmed and driven by habit, by uh, lustful desire, by cultural predetermination. I mean, we think we've got choice, but really the only radical choice we have is not to sin, is to break free from what's driving us, right? We, and so, of course, Jeremiah the prophet says, woe to those who call darkness light, bitter, sweet, good, evil. But this is what our culture has taught us to do. Good is what I feel my passions drive me to do, right? I'm free if I feel like uh, you know, sinning a certain way, if I just go and sin that way, that means I'm free. That's what freedom looks like. No. You're enslaved to your passion. Right? And the only real freedom you have, and you do have this freedom, is to say no to your passion, to say no to that misdirected desire and begin to direct it in the right direction, or begin to learn how, or to begin to learn to begin to learn to. <laughs> it's, it's not nearly as easy as we think. This is why the concept of journey is so important. Salvation is not a slam dunk for anybody, right? Because it's not. It's not about that, that the problem with the legal metaphor, like we talked about last time, is that it gives this impression that God has a problem, and once God solves it, I'm saved no matter what. You know? But if salvation is understood as I me changing like the steel, right? Going from the old man to the new man, the old nature to the new nature, staying myself, but my nature changing, right? From the old man to the new man, then, it, then you see, oh. But the good news is, you know, like the thief on the cross, it's, it's not like you have to finish the journey in order to be saved. No, you just have to be on the journey. Because it's a gift. It's all a gift. It's all grace. Right? So the thief on the cross is no more or less saved than somebody who lives 90 years and prays 20 hours a day. It's all a gift. It's all, it's all grace. But you've got to be on the road. 
So, okay, we'll end with this because there doesn't seem to be lots of questions. You have a question? Okay. Where does the desire for perverseness and sin come from? If we are made in the image of God, He doesn't have these evil desires. Right. So, where are where is the desire that rooted? Right. It comes from choosing wrong. That we see this is God created us in His image, and part of that was the ability to will. And um, you know, the fathers teach that Adam and Eve were like infants in terms of their maturity. They were probably adults in their body, but in terms of their spiritual maturity, they were like infants. And so they were easily deceived and chose poorly. And then they compound the error by hiding, which is what I do every day. I have some sort of a stray thought, that captivates me, and before you know it, I'm caught in some sort of lust for somebody else's car, or uh, uh, anger at somebody who didn't use their turn signal, and, and then I'm trying to deny it by justifying, I have a right to be angry, I have a, you know, it's their fault, not my fault. The story of the Garden of Eden isn't something that just happened once long ago. No, no, no. It's the paradigm. It's the story of what happens inside me all the time, every day. The serpent is whispering in my ear. I'm lusting for things. And then I'm blaming others and <coughs> trying to hide my sin. So it's not like because of his image, God, if you wanted to, could just kill somebody for no reason. He could do these, what we would call evil things, but he wills that he doesn't. He willfully does not do bad things to people. He, he blesses. Well, he, he loves he, people. He loves people. He willfully doesn't hate people. He chooses love, and that's because he has the ability to choose evil, but he doesn't. Right. We have the ability to, but we do. Uh, we'll let it stand there. Uh, it's close. How's that? <laughs> okay, let's end with this thing. Remember the parable of the workers in the vineyard? And the guy goes out and says, early in the morning, six in the morning, finds him, go work in the vineyard, I'll give you a uh, denarius for the day, and then goes out at nine o'clock, and then noon, and then three o'clock, and then at the eleventh <coughs> hour. So just before closing time, he finds some people and sends them into the vineyard, and they only work for one hour, and they all get paid the same. And the people who worked all day says, wait a minute, you know, that's not fair. We, we worked all day, and you're making them equal to us. And he says, well, what are you, you know, are you jealous? And it's actually, the word is evil eye. Do you have an evil eye? Are you jealous because I'm good? But, but think about it. What did the people who worked all day have? that the people who didn't work all day didn't have. Purpose. What's that? Purpose. Purpose, peace, security, a relationship with the vineyard owner. They had meaningful <coughs> work, right? The other people spent the entire day in vanity, emptiness, worrying, what am I going to do, right? people who were working all day, they were in the Father's vineyard. They were secure, right? And so, uh, so being on that journey, right, what's the benefit I get as opposed to the fellow who, who the thief on the cross, the last minute experience, what do I get? I get to be with the Father. I get to work with the Father in his vineyard. That's what I get. And at the end, we both get the same pay. And what's the pay? The presence of God. What's the pay? That's the denarius. We all get to be in his presence. All right? God bless you. And uh, I hope uh, this wasn't too uh, boring or difficult. And um, again, we'll
continue next week. And we're talking about salvation. All right. Thank you.